How it all ends, we're looking at God's gift to us that, that when Jesus was nearing the end of his earthly ministry, and in that countdown to the cross, he spends two chapters of the book of Matthew giving his sermon on how it all ends. And so what we've done is we start in Matthew 6, and we went to Matthew 24, we're going to be there, and then we're going to continue into Revelation. In this third part, we're going to start looking at those birth pains. Now what I mean by that is God has introduced the end first in that prayer that we all know. When we say that, thy kingdom come, God is treasuring up all those prayers. Do you remember what happens to our prayers? Revelation 5, 8 says God collects them. Revelation 8, 3 says they're in these bowls and they are in front of his throne. And at appropriate times, he has angels come and dip out those prayers and ignite them from the altars that are on the coal, the, from the coals in the altar that's before God, and igniting them, they thur- hurl them down to the earth, and that's the answered prayers. So remember, God answers all of our prayers, either yes, no, or wait. And the no ones is because we ask according, as James says, we ask according to our own lusts, and we don't get because we want what we want instead of what God wants. But when we want what God wants, God answers that prayer either immediately or later. Thy kingdom come is one of those later ones. That's when God rights all wrongs. That's when God finally meets out the justice that sinners uh, really have deserved, but God hasn't given it to them. Well, he outlined that in Matthew 24. So we saw the thy kingdom come in the last couple days, and I alluded to the birth pain trends, but we're going to see that. And then they're fully illustrated in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is kind of like National Geographic. Did you ever like those, turn the pages, look at the elephants and all the pretty orchids and butterflies and everything else? And and it's just mostly pictures and a few words. Revelation is the illustration book for the whole Bible of all these promises of God. But what did Jesus say? And look at Matthew 24, and I'm going to read starting in verse 8. Matthew 24 And what Jesus said, all these things are the beginning of sorrows, Odin, uh, pains tied to the deep pain of of the travail is also another way they translate it, a birth, okay? Now, I have personally witnessed eight births, I mean personally. Uh, I would be standing next to Bonnie and I'd say, oh, another one's coming. And she goes, I know, you know, they have this fetal monitor and I'm watching all these you know, uh, rising uh, waves of of the contractions and everything, and I'm just looking at the screen, and I'm saying, okay, let's breathe. (sighs) Did any of you do that, Lamaze and all that stuff? Do you remember all that? Yeah, yeah. Well, imagine Jesus said all of these. What's that? Verse 6, you'll hear of wars and rumors of war. Verse 7, nation will rise against nation, famines, pestilences. All of these are the beginning of sorrows, a.k.a. birth pains. Now, move down to verse 33. So you also, when you see all these things, what he said is, at the end, all the things God said are going to be happening at the second coming of Christ will all be operating at the same time. So truly, throughout all centuries, everyone has always looked forward to Christ's return But to be honest, all the things that were present at the second coming have not always been operating throughout all these years. For example, it was impossible for everybody on earth to be killed by humanity until 1945. The advent of weapons of mass destruction with the atomic bomb. Before that, you could only kill the people you could get close enough to to either fire your projectile or shoot your projectile or dispense your, you know, World War I poison gas and I guess other people have done it. You know, even in the early conflict, you could only get so many people with your sword, with your spear, with your whatever. But now all of a sudden, the unleashing, not only of atomic warfare... I mean, the Israelis invented the neutron bomb. I mean, isn't that amazing? A bomb that explodes and kills everyone and doesn't ruin anything. Isn't that amazing? It just irradiates them with all these neutrons that go out and fry their marrow of their bones and dissipate organic life. 
And it leaves the buildings and the cars and everything is fine. So we started proliferating mass destruction and, and all the other things we'll look at. So when you see all these things, no, it's near. It's at the doors. But look at this, verse 34, Jesus goes on to say how it all ends by saying, surely I say to you, this generation. The generation that witnesses these things will be alive as they unfold. It's very fascinating how long a generation is, and I'm not into all that, so I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, I'm just going to say, let's look at the birth pains, okay? So we'll start. Basically what Jesus said is that God the Father gave the specific trends at the end of the world. He says that those trends that he mentions in the scripture, I just read Matthew 24, uh, 8, 33, and 34, are expanded in Revelation. Now, the ones Jesus gave were these, and I showed you this yesterday, the false Christ. So there's going to be the presence of these false Christ, these false teachers, that's going to not just be localized here and there, but it's going to become universal. So, so what's amazing? I mean, think about this. When Abraham, his nephew, was living in a bad place, nobody knew it was a bad place except traders that came through Sodom and Gomorrah and went, ooh, boy, this is a different, oh, I'm going to stay away from there, or vice versa, I'm going, wow, that's really wonderful, you know, evil, I want to partake. But it was localized. It was in Sodom, it was in Gomorrah, it was in the cities of the plain, and local traders and, and travelers and vacationers from Sodom would take their sodomy with them, but it just was kind of like there. And 99% of the world didn't know about it. Nowadays, uh, you can know about everything, anywhere, and almost evil is triumphed online and promulgated. So we live in a completely different era where evil is not localized. So false Christ and false teaching has now become global. Anybody can say anything and push a button and it's published. And in TikTok videos, do you know what TikTok? It's not just the sound of a clock. It is the most current popular young people form. And New York Times, uh, that I read every day, New York Times did an analysis, an independent analysis of the front page of TikTok, which is, which is totally driven for whoever you are because you have to sign in and tell some details. And they looked at it and they did a great big full page spread of what comes up on the phone screen of young people on TikTok, and they said, this quadrant will all be like bestiality, and this part will be demonism, and this part will be suicidal, and this part will be, you know, druggy, and this part will be, and they said, that is what the minds of our generation of eight to 13 year olds and upward are constantly feasting on evil, faults. And then he said, war like the red horse, and famine. I mean, did you hear yesterday when uh, uh, Rich said that corn is up 50, or wheat is up 50%? I mean, it's unbelievable. What we're seeing is starting to happen, even today. Now, I know this is a blip, but we're getting a foretaste of what is going to become global. Uh, the, the death, you know, we've seen a little bit with the six million people that have died of COVID, but. God says death is going to be global and it's going to be a fourth of all the earth. A fourth? You know what that means? That means a minimum of two and a half million people will have to die every day of the great tribulation. Two and a half million? How do you bury them? Where do you bury them? Because if they're dying, the people are going to be aghast and horrified and it's going to be destruction. So just think of the magnitude of death and then martyrdom. Every believer on earth will be hunted down. And the only believers that remain are the ones that God doesn't allow to be killed. They're called the 144,000 or the two witnesses who, by the way, end up getting killed. Or the angel who is impossible to be killed that speaks the gospel in chapter 14. But every other on earth believer is executed as they get saved. That's why they're beheaded and all that stuff. So, and then the, the signs of the weather and everything else. So let's, let's go through. Basically, what the Bible says is this. The end of the world trends are, they're going to have birth pain or birth pain characteristics, which means this, they're going to be greater frequency. 
Uh, I remember with Bonnie, you know, that, that the, the peaks would have these troughs between them of her contractions, and then there'd be another peak, and then there'd be this kind of little delay, and then another one. But what happened on the monitor is they started to get, so it was like all peaks. Their, their, their frequency became so close together, and their intensity completely got her attention. Have any of you had children? It's a very attention-grabbing situation. You aren't thinking about anything else. And then the joy of the child coming, you know, kind of pushes aside temporarily that horrible pain. The visibility. I mean, Bonnie would grimace. Uh, you know, I thought I was having the baby. <laughs> and I realized, looking at her, she was the one feeling all this. And then the greater impact. So all of these trends are going to get closer together, stronger. Everyone on earth is going to be watching them. And they're going to start impacting everyday life so it's no longer normal. What do I mean? Well, global diseases will get more and more lethal. I mean, that's the thing about COVID. The lethality of COVID is nothing compared to what, you know, the, the 1918 influenza virus was lethal. I mean, it killed 50 million. I mean, we've had three years going and we're on only six million. So the lethality, the, 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 the way the pathogen impacts the population across the spectrum was nothing like it was in the past. Well, the one's coming. I mean, they're just going to get stronger and stronger, more lethal. The, the warming is going to get hotter. I mean, they say that Kuwait will be uninhabitable in the next 20 years. You know, the, the oil nation on the Gulf. Why? Because the, the air temperature is going to too long be past 100. And life just can't exist when it's 365 days, 100 degrees and up. Water-based life doesn't do well. And so global warming, whether it's human-caused divine judgment or both it doesn't matter don't argue about it it is global warming it is warming now it's gone in cycles and scientists know that and they try and not say that because it's they want to get their agenda out but global warming we happen to be on one of the upticks of that which is recorded in tree rings for thousands of years we've had cycles of drought and global warming and solar Radiance and solar gloom, the maunder minimum, you know all this stuff. But it's getting hotter right now. Uh, water shortage is getting worse. I mean, if I lived in Phoenix, if I lived in Vegas, if I lived in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is an engineering marvel. There is a, a river of trucks that comes in every night through the passes, the El Cajon and the other passes, and bring in what that city needs for the day. And if there's any interruption of the, of the river of trucks or all of those huge water, you know, big water irrigation things they bring to the city, Los Angeles would come to a standstill. Now, New York City has that massive underground, carved out of the rock water retention system that's great. So don't stay in New York. Don't live in the desert cities. Because water shortages, did you hear Nebraska, their navy took over part of the, uh, the water aquifer and said that there's a treaty from the 1800s that the water has to go this way instead of that way through Colorado and down into the Colorado Basin? I didn't know Nebraska had a navy. But it's gotten to the point where they're fighting over water upstream. And that's only America. You ought to see what it's like in India. Uh, food scarcity. You can read about that today. Conflicts. There's Ukraine. They're getting bigger and deadlier. Hatred for Christ will only get more personal. Now you notice that the Coinbase, you probably did notice that Coinbase closed the 25,000 crypto accounts of all the Russians. Now they shouldn't have done that no matter how you feel about it, because they've crossed a line. All of a sudden, if there's a current issue that's huge enough, you can do something that's almost capricious. It's not the rule of law. Just because you're upset at the Russians, you're closing their coin-based cryptocurrency accounts? Do you understand what that means? As soon as we, as soon as we followers of Christ are a global menace, see, they just, they'll close your, Apple Pay. They'll close your PayPal. Now, I know you guys don't care. You have cold, hard cash. Well, soon it's going to not be cold or hard. It's going to be completely digital. And they will not allow your credit card to work. I thought that was interesting. Visa and MasterCard cut off all the Russians from using Visa and MasterCard. 
And I filed that. That's exactly what the Antichrist does to believers. Has that ever been possible in the history of the world? Not even up through the 80s, it wasn't possible. Currency, physical currency, has ruled. But slowly, digital currency, because we have too much money. There's only $2 trillion of paper American dollars. Do you know how much our, our total wealth of America is? Mm, about $100 trillion. So that means there's like 50 times more wealth than there is paper money. So you try and get paper money. If everybody tried to get paper money, it would run out in about an hour. That's, that's how little there is compared to how much wealth we have. And then global tracking. I, I told you about my doorbell. Well, it's not mine. I don't like it. It's Bonnie's doorbell. Okay, so what that tracks all the faces and tells us who's at the door? So basically, this is the book of Revelation. We're the church on earth right now. And the next event for us is described as going to our Father's house, John 14. It's described in Luke 24 in the same way that I've gone to heaven, I'll so come. In Acts 1, the angel said that. 1 Corinthians 15, it's a twinkling of an eye. And the last trump, 1 Thessalonians 4, it is the dead in Christ rise first. In Revelation 3, the wrath is for the earth dwellers, and I'm going to keep you from the hour. But that's called the rapture. And what we do is we go to heaven. And we go to stand in front of the finish line. The Bema seat that's described in 1 Corinthians 3. And it's much like Burger King used to be. Do you remember when Burger King used to have the flame uh, deal where it was like a wire mesh that went over fire and they would put hamburger patties on it and as you were ordering you'd see the flames coming through and at the other end the Burger King person wearing their hairnet would, and their gloves would catch the flame broiled patty. What it was is all their food went through the fire. That's what they advertised you know it was kind of burger king wow and i used to go there every day i used to love watching the fire and remembering that everything you and i do goes on a conveyor belt and it's going to go through the fire and it's not a burger king employee it's jesus christ standing at the other end waiting to see what's left of my life that doesn't get burned up what gets burned up stuff that is good for nothing it's not sin it's just worthless it's kind of like endlessly watching Home Shopping Network or endlessly watching sports or endlessly watching financials. It's something that's not bad. It's not wrong to watch TV. It's not wrong to watch the Travel Channel or whatever. But does it have any eternal benefit? Yeah, if you have a small group that talks about all the materialism that you see in the Home Shopping Network, then that's a very good eternal thing. But what if it's just entertainment? It's not sin, but you wasted that hour. You wasted that day. See, that's what we have to learn. And so that's what's going to be decided at the Bema seat. And it says in 2 Corinthians 5, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we're going to one by one receive for the things done in our body. You know, everybody likes to hide. Take a picture and a few people always go back and then the proud ones come to the front. You know, you always see that. Did you know the judgment seat there's nowhere to hide. We stand. Actually, the Greek word is phanerothenai. We're revealed to all. And Jesus dumps our life on the conveyor belt that Burger King had. And he collects what doesn't burn. And he comes to us and presents it to us. And that becomes what we cast at his feet forever. Amen. Wow. That's more important than knowing the National League stats. You understand what I mean? So that's what, what happens there. Then the tribulation starts. That's at the bottom. See, that's Revelation 6 through 18. And then is the second coming of Christ, uh, fulfilling one-fourth of the Old Testament prophets. And then that launches Christ's thousand-year rule, which is in chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. And then finally, once and for all, God proves that a perfect environment does not produce perfect people. I mean, do you remember Lyndon Baines Johnson's great society that if we just clean up the inner city, all the people will get cleaned up? It didn't work, and it still doesn't work, and it won't work in the future. God gives them a near-perfect Eden-like earth where there are no carnivorous animals, no venomous creatures. Remember all those things you read about in Isaiah? And look what happens after a thousand years of perfect environment. No pollution, 
No death, no disease, no dying. You will live the whole thousand years in youthfulness if you're on the earth and survive the tribulation and populate the earth as we read about. And yet, let Satan out of the pit where he's confined for a thousand years. In one instant, he turns in chapter 20, verses 7 to 15, he turns the entire world instantly against God in a perfect environment. Wow. So what happens? Boom. We have the final great white throne judgment. They who did not receive Christ are cast in the lake of fire, and we get to dwell in the house of the Lord forever with all the saints of all time. So that's basically what the Lord sent to the church. Now look at this. Uh, the, the, the book of Revelation is 22 chapters about how to live for God in an ever-darkening world. Jesus returns to heaven. That's right after the cross. There's the first generation church while the gospels and epistles are finished, spread widely. Then slowly the apostles are martyred and the second generation church goes along and only John the apostle is left and Jesus comes back to visit how the churches are doing, applying in their lives the gospels, the epistles, the Old Testament, in other words, the word of God. And they are living through those men. Caesar Augustus, the birth of Christ, Tiberius during the ministry of Christ, Caligula uh, near the, the be launch of Paul's ministry, and Claudius, most of Paul's great missionary work. By the way, I love Claudius. You notice the little map in the bottom shows how big the empire is. He's the one that, boop, took over Britain at the bottom half of it and really spread the gospel to the English-speaking world. So this was the Roman Empire. I mean, it was based on the Mediterranean, the, the Middle Earth, you know, the, the idea from Rome radiated out all those roads and everything. And right in the center were those churches. Now see, Rome had begun moving eastward, the, the locus, the center of power. It had gone from the Italian peninsula, they kept the Senate there, they kept, you know, the Colosseum there, but actual civilization, that area that you're looking at, that would be like Los Angeles, Miami, Chicago, New York City, Houston, wherever you're from, Boston, all of the big cities that were most important were there. That was the epicenter of the Roman Empire. And look what happened. The church at the epicenter had to endure centuries of godless, immoral emperors who were acting like Putin. Ruthless, no one restraining them. And Revelation was sent to guide believers through hard times like that. And basically, the longest living apostle, see this God orchestrated this. John was central to Christ's ministry. Remember, he's the one that Jesus loved, that was there, that Jesus leaned his head on. He was central to God's New Testament plan. He's the one that got to take care of Mary. He's the one that Jesus told Peter, I have special plans for him. Peter, why don't you worry about your own thing? Don't worry about John. I've got a plan for him. I mean, from the beginning, he was pointed out that he would be the last living link to God the Son in human flesh. So important so he could write this book. And an entire generation of churches in Asia, in the epicenter, like we're living in the epicenter. America is kind of the epicenter of the world. I mean, even though no one likes us, and even though we are more in debt than everybody else, we still are the dominant language, currency, influence, from media to everything. John served the largest church. Eusebius says Ephesus had upwards of 50,000 believers. And John was pastoring there. Mary died there. Uh, he wrote the premier gospel, the last gospel, the gospel by John. And then he wrote three vital epistles. But then God says, I want you to write this, the book of Revelation. I want you to give to that church in the epicenter the ending, how it all ends. Because they think they're in the ending. And I want them to know how to behave for me. How to not have your life get ruined and burned up in the fires of 1 Corinthians 3. So Revelation, because of the plurality, to the churches, wasn't just to the seven, but was to all churches throughout all times. And, and uh, you'll have to come to the Bible Institute course to get all the details. I'm just summarizing them for you. But it's for all of us today. So this is what I'd like to do if it works. Bonnie and I got to spend October and November teaching Paul's life and letters, all 13 of his epistles, and we taught them 
for about six weeks in Greece, and then we taught him for two more weeks in Rome. Can you imagine teaching the book of Romans in Rome to students? It was magnificent. Part of it was we got to travel between the islands of Greece and teach on different islands. It was marvelous. I mean, to teach Titus on Crete, where Paul wrote to Titus on Crete and everything. And so I took this clip of Patmos for you. Let's see if it works. What does God think someone needs when they're struggling and alone and in danger? Well, the book of Revelation was written to someone just like that. The Apostle John was on a rocky, barren island called Patmos on the Aegean Sea. That's exactly where we are right now, on a rocky, barren, seaside island on the Aegean Sea. And John remembered the loss of all of his beloved brothers in ministry. The apostles had each been hunted down and martyred by the empire. He was the last one, and they got him, and they put him here in exile. But as the years went by, he began to remember. He remembered his beloved city was gone, destroyed, leveled. The hundreds of thousands of fellow Jews massacred or sold into slavery. And now here he was, old, weak, alone, and in danger. So what does God think you need when the empire is against you and hunting you down and when the world seems to be headed toward destruction? Well, it sounds kind of like the times we live in. If you're listening to the news at all about global warming and water scarcity and the environment being destroyed by humanity's uh, industries and CO2 admission, emissions, it, it's true. The earth is shaking and groaning and dying, just like it says in God's Word. And so what's the, the most encouraging thing that God could send? Well, to the Apostle John, it was this book of Revelation. And he said, you're blessed if you read it, and you're blessed if you heed it, and you're blessed if you keep the things that are written in it. And that's what this course is about. We're looking at the book of Revelation. We're looking at every chapter. We're looking at every word. We're looking at every truth and doctrine and attribute of God. We're seeing God's roadmap of the future, but most of all, we're getting the blessing of being encouraged as God tells us what's ahead and the fact that he knows right where we are. He knew John was here on a rocky island and he knows your address today. And that's what we need to trust his presence, his care, and his plan. What a joy. What a joy, because there's a global panic attack coming. You think this is bad right now? Do you think, you know, watching wheat and gas and $130 a barrel for oil? I mean, they're saying it's going to go to 200 this month. I mean, what does that mean? Did you know that everything's made of oil? Even our, think about it, even our fertilizer that fertilizes our plants comes from burning natural gas to make those nitrogens that are used in. So everything, I mean, everything you eat is somehow touched by oil. So there's a panic attack. In fact, this is how Jesus described it. Look at Luke 21. Look at the red part. Verse 26, men's hearts will fail them from fear and expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. That's the global panic attack. I just pulled out the NOAA chart of disasters, you know, droughts and freeze and cyclones and everything, just for the last 40 years. Now, I know it's just the last 40 years. You, the NOAA hasn't kept track. I mean, I wish I could pull it back 2,000 years. I think what we'd see is this, that there are these cycles. But look at the trajectory. That's what most stockbrokers say they're going to do with your funds. You know, make them big. God is making the disasters to get the world's attention. So last August, we had the largest earthquake that shook the U.S. in 50 years hit off the Alaskan coast. And what it reminds us is the earth is shaking and dying. I love, I clipped this out of the news. This is all the people fleeing Alaska. And it reminded me of Luke 21 that says there will be great earthquakes in various places. And as they were driving to flee Alaska, the road was buckling. And so you had, your car had to drop a foot or two. You had to get a little speed going so you could get over 
and just hope it didn't buckle up and you, you know, ran into it. But what are the things that are the trends? God says, number one, there would be the trend of global travel, an explosion of travel. Many will run to and fro. And basically, all of you know this, the same kind of boat that Jonah fled from God in was the one that Paul sailed around the Mediterranean. Nothing changed in those 1,000 years. Columbus rode a very similar boat that Paul would have ridden on. They were just basically wooden boats with sails. And then Ben Franklin, when the French were helping us in the revolution, same kind of boat until about 150 years ago when the steam engine, then rapidly internal combustion, and then the automobile, and then they figured out how to put one on a light structure and put a little propeller on it, and they started having airplanes, and then they realized that you could make explosions controlled and push things with it, and they started rockets. And now we have four plus billion, 4.5 billion people flew in 2019 before COVID. And they say, Bonnie and I fly all the time, the, the employees are saying that the, the amount of people flying is, is exceeding pre-pandemic levels. So we're just right back to the global travel. How about the, the explosion of knowledge? It says knowledge will increase. Well, I want to show you an object lesson. Do you see my phone here? Everybody see this? Let me read to you what Apple says about it. Just my phone, Apple's description, has in it this little corner right here. And by the way, this isn't the newest one. This is just, the, just before the newest one. See that little corner here? That has a camera with 11.8 billion transistors and a 16-core neural engine. Neural? I thought that was our brain. So it's built like our brain. But look, this corner of my phone, not the whole phone, just this little corner, can do 11 trillion operations a second, also known as a teraflop. Now let's have a perspective. 15 years ago, teraflop calculations, that's trillions of calculations per second. That's what a teraflop is. Were only possible to be done by building-sized, government-funded computers that Japan, U.S., and EU had. And that's where they did weather models, and they did atomic explosion models, and they did all kinds of models like that. And now what only vast sovereign states could have, every one of us can have in our pocket, a computer. So you know what that means? It means their computers are doing far more, the, the sovereign state computers. You know what it's done? We can start finding stuff out that is very bad to know. Like right now, they're calculating. They have all these sensors all over the world where they keep track of insect populations. You know what? This is, by the way, this is not uh, Hal Lindsey or your favorite prophetic person. This is, this is the governments of the world are noticing that all the insects are dying. In fact, I, I have the headline down here if I can get down to it. They said, we're at that that an entomologist from the University of Connecticut says, they told the Associated Press, insects are absolutely the fabric by which Mother Nature and the Tree of Life are built. The, the canary in the coal mine, the indicator of apocalypse coming, is what's going on with the most minute and fragile elements of the whole process, which are the insects. Now all of you know, it, when I was a little boy and you drove to church on Wednesday night, the in an August, your whole windshield was <laughs> Any of you remember that? Bug, 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 hitting. Yeah, and you used to have to stop at the gas station on vacation and your dad was out there cleaning that windshield. Do you clean your windshield much from bugs anymore? Yeah, during the Mayfly explosion, maybe now and then. Bugs are dying at, at a rate of one to 2% a year and have been for 30 years. And they're charting this all over the world. The Germans are most scared about it. How about this? They, they've started setting up little sensors in the Himalayas. And they found that the Himalayas? I mean, the, the Tibetan plateau, that's about as remote as you can get from anything. It's filled with enough plastic that is nanoparticle size that if you weren't wearing your oxygen mask, you would be ingesting plastic, filling your lungs, going through the alveoli into your circulation, pumping around, and going through to every cell of your body. Did you know all of us have a measurable amount of plastic? And I don't mean 
the valve you had put in or the, you know, the replacement. I'm talking about we have breathed in and eaten. You ought to read this article. It's enough to make you sick. That's just one tiny example of the global explosion of knowledge that's making people afraid. How about global weather? What the Lord says is, there's going to be distress among people. They're going to be perplexed. The weather, the sea, the waves, it's just going to be, what's going to happen next? See, that's, that's actually, how's this all going to end? What's going to happen next? Is, did you know what they said this morning? The Word of Life staff was all right here, and there was a devotional prayer time and everything this morning. And what one of the reports was, it was really a blessing, that there was a team associated with Word of Life that runs a prayer booth at a flea market, and there was a long line of people that were waiting for someone that knows the Lord to pray for them. Wow. Now that, talk about being on the cutting edge. I think you ought to, instead of thinking about selling your depression glass and occupied China, you know, Japanese stuff junk at a flea market, you ought to start a prayer booth, you know? See, that's what our world is looking for. But what's going on? I mean, this is last year. California had 49 degrees centigrade heat wave. We don't like centigrade, but you know what that was? Hot, okay? I mean, Canada, people were dying in their apartments in Canada. They don't have air conditioning because it's the beautiful Northwood stuff. It was 70 people in Toronto. And you heard about all the ones that died in British Columbia. Uh, you know, islands off of the African coast, Algeria. I mean, Algeria was so hot that, that it made the pavement, when you walked on blacktop, your feet sunk in. You know how it is. It's just impossible. Greece, I mean, Bonnie and I were there. You should see the wildfires. Uh, between our conference center and Athens, it was just totally, it looked like the end of the world. It looked like an uh, apocalyptic scene. And it came down so fast, it exploded all their propane tanks. People ran into the Aegean Sea and ducked under the water trying to survive because of the fires that came because it was so hot and dry. And Sweden had... Look at how red Sweden is. I mean, that's where they move the, the server farms of Facebook so that they can cool them just with the cold water. It's not cool enough anymore up there. And of course, Japan had a heat wave in the largest city in the world, Tokyo, and all the people died in their apartments because the air conditioning wouldn't keep up. I like this. I clipped it off the NOAA. That is last year's Derrico. It'll keep playing. It, it went from South Dakota to Ohio, 770 miles in 14 hours, and it produced so much damage, and I didn't even know what was going on. Bonnie and I were actually driving between two of our 52 greatest chapter small group sites where I was teaching, and as we were driving, we kept looking out the windows, and we were crossing Iowa, and all the cornfields were down. I went, they didn't harvest it this year, they just pushed them down, I wonder why. For 60 miles, the cornfields were laying down. And we got to our hotel in Ames or wherever it was, and you know, they said, boy, good thing you got here today. Yesterday, that thing went through, and it took out all of our power, and it's destroyed, look at that, millions of acres of corn and soybeans. Why do you think Revelation 6 says that one of the hallmarks of the tribulation is going to be starvation stalking the earth. And I don't need to talk about the wildfires, except this is how satellites and God see the earth. Look at the whole West Coast on fire last year. And that smoke, that smoke out into the Pacific, halfway to Hawaii. And then, of course, the solar storms. Bloomberg is even noticing it, the premier news service for investors. Solar storms are back. They're threatening power grids. Uh, four weeks ago, Elon Musk, who's famous for helping Ukraine, lost 40 satellites from a solar flare. 40 in one. Wow. What is that supposed to do to us? Scare us? No. What's repeated 46 times in Revelation? With all these dangerous trends increasing, God wants us convinced. And he wrote this book to convince us he's on the throne. Do you see the, the, all those little dots are the, the uh, orangish yellow gold ones are thrown. Look at that big red column. That's chapter 4. That's the most throny of all. And basically, if you study Revelation, it's the only book of the Bible that has all 25 of God's attributes. Systematic theologians have determined that there are 25 
communicable and incommunicable attributes of God, if you remember your systematic theology, every one of those, independence and change, this is what God is. Eternity, omnipresence, unity, spirituality, invisibility, omniscience, truthfulness, goodness, love, all of those are not only mentioned in Revelation, they're illustrated in Revelation, and they're connected to God who is seen, Jesus Christ, the exact image of the invisible God. And all of us know at least these four, okay? His omnipresence, that he's everywhere, that he knows everything, that he completely loves us, and that he is all-powerful. What does God want us to do the more we see everything falling apart? Whoop, stop, this, stop, stop, stop. There, I talked to my computer. It got excited because it saw it's 1030. Um, <laughs> God wants us to apply his attributes into our life, and he wants us to start getting all of our fears into perspective. He wants us to remember he is our creator. You were designed just like you are today. Everything about each of us, the unchangeable parts, not our choices, the things that we came with in the package, God picked and he even picked what generation we live in. He even picked what country we live in. Remember Acts 17 says that he has determined the boundaries and the appointed place for mankind to live over the face of the earth. So you were chosen to be here now. And so was I. And then he bought us. Boy, that's just creator. That's true for everybody. Then he bought us. And he says, I bought you so that for the rest of your life you will do that you will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and let everything else be added to you because you're going to answer to me now we're not going to answer whether or not we're going to heaven we're going to answer what we did with our one and only precious life how much of it we live for him well I teach the students and I'll show you uh, this is the prayer I wrote for today after studying all this do you know I actually study this and, and apply it to my own life before I share it with you because I don't want to be a second-hand peddler. I want to actually not, not try and live up to my preaching but preach what I'm living. That's what John MacArthur, Mike asked me what I learned from him. That was the, the best thing I learned from him. He says, don't ever try and live up to your own preaching. He said, only preach what you're living. Well, that was sobering. I couldn't preach for quite a few weeks after that, you know, until I caught up, you know. But this is what I wrote, Lord... As I remember the truth you taught in the area around the temple. Do you remember I showed you that chart where everything, where he gave all those different things? My heart overflows. You're the water of life that satisfies me, and you're the light of the world that guides me, and you're my good shepherd, and I hear your voice, and I want to follow you. And as you remind me of your plans for the end of the world, I want to respond. I want to be willing to do your will. I want to be alert. I want to follow you, my good shepherd, to the end of my journey that you have planned. What a, new, a joy to know, follow, and serve you. For Jesus' sake, amen. See, we know how it all ends. And I can assure you, the birth pains have started because you're the only generation, we're the only generation, that the whole world is experiencing events in real time. Everyone's experiencing Ukraine around the world. Everyone's experiencing the food scarcity coming. Everyone's experiencing the fear of nuclear weapons being unleashed after 70 years. You understand what I mean? It used to be a pocket here, a pocket there. Everyone. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for choosing, designing us to live in such a time as this. And I pray that we would seek first your kingdom, your rule in our lives, and truly hunger and thirst after your righteousness, and let everything else be added to us. We trust you with our lives. Let us use our life's breath that you have given to us, that you redeemed us to offer back to you. Let us use it for you each day. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.